Thanks very much for the introduction and for the invitation to come talk with you. And thanks to everybody for joining from uh, whatever time zones you're in. So apropos of the affiliations that were mentioned, I am starting a group amongst the quantum institutes at the University of Maryland and NIST. And we wanna turn that into quantum thermodynamics central. So if you visit the DC area and you do quantum thermodynamics or you want to do quantum thermodynamics, then please stop by and give us a visit. I'd like to motivate this field with a simple story about how information can serve as a resource in a thermodynamic task, namely work extraction. For our setup, we'll consider one of the favorite setups of all physicists, a gas in a box. This gas will be classical to start with at least. It exchanges heat with a temperature T bath through the walls of the box. And it's an oversimplified ideal gas. So it's just one particle, so very, very simple ideal gas. During our protocol, we will slide a partition into the box's center. Like so. Then we'll measure whether the particle is on the left-hand side of the box or the right-hand side of the box. So we'll receive one bit of information, one of two possible outcomes. In this case, the answer is the right-hand side of the box. Then we'll tie a rope to the partition, like so. And there's some pulley up here and some pulley over here. So the rope goes through. And we'll tie an anvil to the rope. Let's make it an Acme anvil like in the Looney Tunes cartoons with Coyote and the Roadrunner. Runner. Then we unfix the partition to let it slide. This particle is going to punch the partition. And it's going to keep punching the partition until the partition gets to the opposite side of the box. So it ends up about here. So what happens? Let's analyze this scenario. First of all, the anvil is lifted because this partition is connected to the rope, so the rope gets pulled. And I did draw the pulley systems wrongly, so sorry about that, but the rope gets pulled upward, and so the Acme anvil gets pulled upward. In other words, the, ac the anvil gains gravitational potential energy. So we've performed work on the anvil. How much work can we perform? This type of work is pressure volume work. So we'll write out an integral of pressure times the differential volume elements from the initial volume to the final volume. Uh, Nicole, we still see your first slide uh, with the setup and the protocol. That's interesting. Is that better? Yes, now we see uh, analysis and the integral. Awesome, thank okay. you. Okay, great. Now we all know the form of the ideal gas law. Pressure times volume equals the particle number times Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. In our very simple example, the particle number is one. And we can solve for the pressure in terms of the volume. And then, we can substitute into our integral. This is what we just found. And I'm gonna integrate from V over two to V. So I'll put primes on these Vs because the particle begins confined to half the box, but can end up anywhere in the whole box. Then we integrate.
and we evaluate the endpoints and find that we can do an amount of work up to Boltzmann's constant times the temperature times log two. Where did this energy come from? Please write your answers in the chat. So we just performed work. Where did the work come from? Where did that energy come from? A reminder, this is our setup and there's some work being performed. Where does that energy come from? So it comes from the bath, which supplies heat to the system. So the bath is supplying heat, which is random energy. It's not coordinated. In contrast, work is in a sense organized energy it's useful we can use it to push a car up a hill or charge a battery so how did we turn this useless heat into useful work by using our bit of information so at the end of the protocol we have no idea where in the box the particle is it could be anywhere so we've traded our information for work so a synopsis of this engine is that information plus heat can give us work, or information can serve as a resource in thermodynamics. This is one taste of why it makes any sense to combine information theory with thermodynamics. This story was originally told by Leo Szilard, who was a great Hungarian-American mathematical physicist of the 20th century. Any questions about this information engine? Okay, then let's move on to what we should cover in the rest of the talk. We started out with this information engine, this simple illustration that it makes some sense to put together information theory and thermodynamics. Oops, wrong word. Then I'll talk about thermodynamics and quantum information individually and together. By the way, from now on, I'll often abbreviate quantum information with QI and quantum with just a Q. Then we'll go back to that information engine and see what happens if we make it quantum. And finally, I'll give a whirlwind tour of the landscape of quantum thermodynamics. Quantum thermodynamics is a diverse field with lots of different subfields in which people do different sorts of things. So I'll give a little sampling of what is going on today. In case you're interested, I can suggest a few references. Many have been written. These are a few that I've happened to find useful. First, there were a couple of reviews written a few years ago. This field does move very quickly. So much has happened since then, but they provide very nice overviews of the many subfields of quantum thermodynamics and a lot of the key concepts. And if you want something different, then I can point to this article I wrote for Scientific American last year about as was mentioned earlier, what I like to call this field quantum steampunk. And if you have problems with the paywall, then feel free to send me an email. Looks like there are questions in the chat. Uh, some, okay. a few people weren't able to see your screen, but I think it's good now. Okay, great. We, we can see all your, uh, all your writing. Okay, excellent. 
then let's move on to a quick review of what thermodynamics even is and what it involves and why putting it together with quantum information makes sense. We'll start with thermodynamics. So what is thermodynamics? Write down your answers in the chat. Probably most people here have at least taken a, or a class that covers thermodynamics. One suggestion is the study of warmth. That's definitely involved. We can say more generally, the science of energy. The various forms of energy like heat and gravitational potential energy and so on, and the transformations between those possible forms. The thermodynamics has what I like to think of as some personality traits. At least traditionally, it is focused on large scale quantities. Examples include temperature, pressure, volume, particle number, etc. So to measure these properties, we don't have to know anything about the microscopics. We don't even have to know that the system consists of particles. And in fact, during the 1800s, a lot of thermodynamicists simply did not believe that matter consisted of particles because they couldn't see the particles. So we don't have to know those microscopic details. And suppose that you're given some calculations, some piece of physics, and you want to test whether it's thermodynamics or statistical mechanics, then one very gross, simple test is to check whether it involves probabilities or density operators. Because at least traditionally, thermodynamics doesn't involve those. However, I will invoke probabilities and density operators and still say that what I'm doing is thermodynamics because of the next two personality traits. Thermodynamics is operational or agent-based. After all, thermodynamics was born during the Industrial Revolution. So, uh, British engineer Thomas Savory invented a steam engine in 1698. It was improved upon by another engineer, Thomas Newcomen, in 1712. And then James Watt made a very good version in 1776. This was used to pump water out of mines. Very practical task. And then people started using engines to power factories. So people wondered you know, how efficiently can an engine perform work? And thermodynamics started working. Or more generally, how efficiently can an agent perform an operational task given certain resources? Examples of such tasks include the one that we covered in the last section, so performing work, or preparing a non-equilibrium state, also energy is conjugate to time, so it should make sense that timekeeping comes under the purview of thermodynamics. In contrast, in statistical mechanics, we tend to just calculate partition functions. Finally, thermodynamics tends to highlight heat, work, and entropy. This entropy, together with the operational focus, will help tie thermodynamics together closely with quantum information theory. Alas, all is not well with thermodynamics.
It was developed again during the 1800s for steam engines, big classical systems and mostly equilibrium settings. So it's missing a number of very interesting contexts. Small systems, including quantum systems and far from equilibrium systems. Also, Szilard's engine showed us that in thermodynamics is closely intertwined with information processing. So we might want to explore that connection. So we need to re-envision this thermodynamics of the 1800s. for the 21st century. One toolkit perform for performing that update is quantum information theory. Since you're at this conference, you all have some familiarity, at least with quantum information theory, but let me emphasize a few certain facets that are particularly relevant of quantum information theory. So by quantum information theory, I mean the study of how we can use quantum phenomena to process information impossible with just classical resources. By process information, I mean solve certain operational problems. So solve computational problems, communicate information, secure information cryptographically, and store information in memories. By quantum phenomena, I mean entanglement, how a measurement can disturb a quantum state, possibly, depending on your definition, the discreteness of energy levels and other levels, and so on. All this means that, very importantly, quantum information theory is operational, just like thermodynamics. We analyze information processing tasks, like how efficiently can we send information down a wire given some noise, just as thermodynamicists analyze thermodynamic tasks. So, how efficiently can we perform information processing tasks? The answer is usually a function of an entropy in both quantum information and thermodynamics. So entropy is an operationalism, again, tie together thermodynamics with quantum information theory. And we'll see some examples of how shortly. So let's talk a little bit about entropies. Again, probably most people here have some familiarity with entropies, but to make sure on, we're all on the same page, let's have a little quick review. These are functions defined on quantum states or probability distributions. That measure uncertainty about an outcome of the measurement, a measurement of the states or the value of a variable distributed according to this probability distribution. Lots of entropic functions exist. I'll discuss two of them. Probably most of you are familiar with the first one but it'll become useful shortly. So let's quickly review the von Neumann entropy. It's 
this is defined for state rho as the negative of the trace of rho log rho. And probably many of you will remember one of its primary applications, data compression. Suppose that I want to send some quantum message to a friend, and according to my friend, what I'm sending is rho. Uh, in fact, suppose that I send many copies n, then I'd like to compress the whole message into the fewest possible qubits. And the minimum number of qubits I need per copy of my states. In the asymptotic limits as the number of copies approaches infinity is the von Neumann entropy, according to Schumacher's theorem. So an entropy quantifies the optimal efficiency with which we can perform an information processing task, data compression. Very similar. is compression in thermodynamics at a constant temperature or isothermal gas compression. For our setup, we will once again have a gas in a box. This gas can be a classical gas of many particles this time. It, again, exchanges heat with some temperature T heat bath through the walls of the box. And the gas begins at thermal equilibrium with the bath. Then during our protocol, we will slide a piston in over here and compress the gas quasi-statically so that the gas is always at thermal equilibrium with a heat bath. Then the gas ends up confined to half the box and so at thermal equilibrium, we might want to know what is the work performed on the gas by the piston? The answer is given to us in statistical physics class. So we should identify the relevant free energy and the free energy is a sort of cost function that we often optimize in thermodynamics. In this case, the Helmholtz free energy is the relevant free energy. It's defined as the internal energy minus the temperature times the thermodynamic entropy. And this Helmholtz free energy is the amount of energy that you would have to spend if you started with nothing, just a vacuum, and then you created this gas from scratch, like pulling a rabbit out of a hat, and warmed up the gas to temperature T. The work required is the final free energy of a compressed gas minus the initial free energy of the uncompressed gas. So an entropy helps quantify the efficiency with which we can perform a thermodynamic task, namely isothermal work, uh, isothermal gas compression. So that's a thermodynamic example, very similar to the quantum information theoretic example. Now let's put the two together and see how in quantum thermodynamics, a work quantity can be, again, some free energy sort of a difference controlled by a quantum entropy. But to summarize, in quantum thermodynamics, excuse me, quantum information and thermodynamics, entropies help quantify the efficiencies with which we can perform operational tasks. Are there any questions about thermodynamics or quantum information separately before we move on to putting the two together?
Okay, then let's put the two together. Looks like there might be a question. What exactly is an operational task? Is there a definition or are there just many examples? I think of an operational task as you know, anything that has a goal such that you can choose your actions in order to achieve that goal, given resources, certain resources, which are specified just by the setup of the problem. Any more questions? Okay. Here is one example of how entropy can bridge the two fields. So at least one place where you can find this example is in this paper, but references there might point to other papers as well. For our setup, we will consider some agents who's at a, in an environment at a fixed temperature T as throughout this talk, or we will often write the inverse temperature, one over Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. Our agents can draw from the environment any system at thermal equilibrium with respect to that temperature and the Hamiltonian that governs the system. So the agents can draw from the environments any system in the states governed by some Hamiltonian age. And in fact, suppose that the agent wants to draw or is able to draw n copies. The agent wants to turn these n copies into some non-equilibrium state. Or copies of a non-equilibrium state by inputting work. So we start off with a bunch of equilibrium states. We're handed some, or we are able to request some battery filled with energy that we can use to perform work. And by performing the work, we can create non-equilibrium states. This is similar to our story of having a gas that's spread out across the box. If we input work to compress the gas, to push in the piston, then we can trap the gas in half the box, which is uh, granted in the problem that we saw with the compression of the gas. Um, the gas begins and ends at thermal equilibrium, but we might want to prepare some system that's not at thermal equilibrium. So the problem that we're looking at here is a more general problem. Also, when we do thermodynamics, we implicitly have in mind the thermodynamic limits in which there are many, 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 many particles. The particle number and the volume go to infinity while their ratio remains constant. But in a generalization of the following results, a generalization I'm not going to show for purposes of time, we can reason about just single copies of a state or thermodynamics at small scales. We would like to know about the minimum amounts of work required. to prepare one of these copies on average over copies. And one simple version of the result is in the limits as the number of copies transforms grows very large, that work is at least Boltzmann's constant times the temperature times the relative entropy between the desired states and the corresponding equilibrium state. 
But the relative entropy is also called the callback liebler divergence. Four states, rho and sigma. This entropy has the form of the trace of rho times the difference of logs, the log of rho and the log of sigma. The, or an operational significance is, this is a measure of how well we can distinguish rho from sigma in a hypothesis test. Suppose that we are given one state, we're told that it's either rho or sigma, we can perform one measurement, and based on the outcome, we'll guess whether we received rho or we received sigma. This relative entropy quantifies how well we can perform that task. So this is an information theoretic quantity. But let's take our results and evaluate it in order to get more physical insights. So this work is given by Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. Now let's use our definition of the relative entropy. So we have one log of rho and one log of the equilibrium state. This part here is the negative of the von Neumann entropy that we saw earlier. And this log can be broken up via a log law. And this term simplifies. Now let's also distribute this row that's out front. We get Boltzmann's constants times the temperature, times the negative of the von Neumann entropy of rho, plus from this exponential beta, times the trace, and we're distributing the rho out front. So that multiplies a Hamiltonian, plus then we get this term over here. We're still carrying a trace of rho, and we have a log z. We're in log z is, excuse me, z is the partition function. Um, so this thermal state up here depends on the inverse temperature and the Hamiltonian partition function just normalizes the state. Because all quantum states are normalized, this trace equals one. We can rearrange some more and find that the work is given by the trace of this term we're left with just a rho times the Hamiltonian minus, now we have this term, temperature times Boltzmann's constant times the von Neumann entropy. And then this final term, I'm gonna write in a slightly funny way. I'm gonna write minus negative log Z. Why? This final term is the free energy of the equilibrium state. It's the free energy we start out with because we can draw equilibrium states for our, from our environment. And this term, joint term over here, is like the internal energy minus the temperature times, if we take this information theoretic entropy and incorporate Boltzmann's constant for dimensionality, then we get something that's sort of akin to the thermodynamic entropy. This is, so this, Left-hand part is sort of like a non-equilibrium. Free energy sort of a thing. So the average work that we need to input in order to prepare a non-equilibrium states um, on average over many copies is sort of a free energy difference. And it's also proportional to how well we can distinguish in an information theoretic task between two quantum states as measured by an entropy, the relative entropy. This illustrates one way in which we can 
use quantum information in thermodynamics to generalize it from or just discussions of classical systems always at equilibrium. So we can use quantum information theory to modernize thermodynamics and generalize it. Furthermore, we can use thermodynamics to understand what distinguishes quantum physics from classical physics. We can use quantum phenomena, we've already said, to process information in ways impossible with just classical systems. And information processing is intertwined with thermodynamics, as, for example, Szilard showed us. So we should expect to be able to use quantum phenomena to perform thermodynamic tasks, such as work extraction, in ways impossible with just classical systems. So thermodynamics can help us understand what separates quantum resources from classical resources. Does anyone have questions about this application of quantum information theory to thermodynamics or the intersection of those fields generally? not, then there is a question. What is the inequality involving work in relative entropy sharp? What is the theorem due to? We do have an inequality here. I put that there because there is a quantum state rho here. There we go. Suppose that this state is uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian, then this inequality is an equality. But if rho does not commute with the Hamiltonian, then the inequality is not necessarily an equality. Um, my expectation would be that still that would be all the work that we would need in order to prepare the quantum state but we would also need another resource, namely a source of coherence. What happens if instead of initial equilibrium states, we consider initial non-equilibrium states? Then we can get a sort of similar free energy type of difference, as in, um, if we start with a non-equilibrium state, that just means you know, we have even more free energy to use to start with in order to prepare the desired state. So I would expect more or less we take uh, or we figure out how much is the free energy that we need to um, prepare the desired states from equilibrium. And we subtract off the amount of free energy that we start with because we start with a state that's out of equilibrium. Okay, thanks for the questions. Now, let me back up this statement that we just made here. So we use quantum information to modernize thermodynamics. Okay, that we already saw, but we can use thermodynamics to understand what distinguishes quantum physics from classical. So we could use quantum resources in thermodynamic tasks. So let's take our information engine, our Szilard engine, and make it quantum. In summary, we said when discussing Szilard's engine that information plus heat can give us work. Many quantum effects on Szilard's engine are known. If you would like to survey a whole range, then I would invite you to check out these two references. 
One is a review paper from a few years ago. And one is a set of two books by Rex and Leff. Books are Maxwell's Demon, to which this information engine is tied, and Maxwell's Demon 2. I will present just one example of a quantum effect on Seelard's engine, the effects of particle statistics. This story comes from a paper in Physical Review Letters. Published in 2011. This work is based on a few assumptions that I'd like to clarify at the beginning that we can incorporate into our setup. First, let's suppose that the engine contains just two, two particles. This is for conceptual simplicity. So we can extract work from using the engine only if both the particles begin on the same side of the barrier. After all, if the particles were on opposite sides, then as much pressure would push this way on the barrier as would push this way. There would be no pressure difference, so the barrier wouldn't move anywhere. Also, these particles don't interact with each other. This assumption was lifted in later papers. The temperature is quite low, so that the system is approximately in its ground state. So I'm going to be considering a few cases. In some of the cases, the particles are quantum. If the particles are quantum, then they obey spin statistics. but do not have spins. The particles need to be in some totally symmetric or totally anti-symmetric state, but the only degree of freedom is position. There is no spin degree of freedom. This might sound quite strange, as we usually think of spins as heavily involved in particle spin statistics. But for instance, a bunch of qubits is can be equivalent to a bunch of spinless fermions via mathematical transformation called a jordan Wigner transformation. And the authors of this paper were actually less interested in how they could get particles that lack spins but obey spin statistics than they were in the implications of what would be possible in this case. So there are three types of particles that we can consider. First, suppose that the particles are distinguishable, classical particles. And when we measure, we'll obtain one of four possible outcomes. We're going to measure on which side of the box each particle is. Particles A and B could be on the left-hand side of the box or A could be on the left-hand side while B is on the right-hand side, B could be on the left-hand side while A is on the right-hand side, or both particles could be on the right-hand side of the box. All of the possibilities are equally likely. There are two cases in which the particles are distributed unevenly across the two sides. So in two out of four cases, particles are distributed unevenly. So 
so our engine can perform work because the particles can push the partition in one direction. Second, suppose that the particles are bosons. The particles are indistinguishable, so we cannot label them A and B. Now when we measure, we'll find one of three possible outcomes. Both particles can start on the left, one can start on the left while one starts on the right, or both particles can start on the right of the box. Again, all the possibilities are equally likely in one, two of these cases. So in two thirds of the cases, the particles are distributed unevenly, so the engine can perform work. Finally, suppose that the particles are fermions. There is only one possible measurement outcome by Pauli's exclusion principle. The fermions have to be on opposite sides of barrier. Otherwise they would be in the same quantum state and that's prohibited by Pauli's principle. So the particles are never distributed unevenly and our engine can never perform work. Where does that leave us? Suppose that we're extracting work in many trials. If we extract work with bosons, then we can extract work at two thirds of the trials. If we extract work with fermions, we can extract work only in half the trials. So the average work extractable with bosons is greater than the average work extractable with fermions, uh, excuse me, with distinguishable particles, which is greater than the average work extractable with fermions. Furthermore, you can check in this paper that as the temperature rises, the quantum particles, because they become distinguishable, all end up yielding the same average work. So all the amounts of work approach the classical distinguishable amount, as you would expect of the macroscopic limit or the classical limit. So we can perform a thermodynamic task, average work extraction, better with certain quantum resources than with classical resources. Are there any questions about the quantum, quantum Seelard engine? like there are some earlier questions. How does one identify the role of coherence in these protocols, given that they all take place at some finite temperature? There are various ways that you can quantify coherence. Um, uh, I won't go into detail about some of the measures, but one example is the relative entropy of coherence, which involves that relative entropy that we saw earlier. So there are various metrics that people have come up with. If you want to search for some of these, then you could look up coherence resource theories, and that should yield a bunch of hits. So is there any experimental evidence for some sort of advantage in using quantum rather than classical resources to carry out some thermodynamic task? Nowadays, uh, there are a lot of quantum thermodynamic experiments that are happening. There have been a lot of quantum engines realized. I'd have to think about, or I'd have to go through some of the literature to see whether they demonstrate quantum advantages. The um, experimental literature, uh, uh, experimental quantum thermodynamics literature has exploded over the past few years. So the, there have been a lot of examples of realizing quantum thermodynamic protocols. Uh, we would just have to go through and check whether any of the predictions of quantum advantages in thermodynamic tasks have been realized experimentally. The predictions of quantum advantages in thermodynamic tasks tend to be based basically just on the quantum mechanics. So they 
it's a little bit embarrassing, but they might not actually, they, they don't really need experimental tests. Um, but it's definitely nice to see whenever we can get an experiment that shows an advantage. As T approaches infinity, how does zero work for fermions become finite? As the temperature grows, the fermions have access to higher energy levels, so they don't all have to be in the ground state. So this fermion over here can be in a different state from this other fermion, even if both the fermions are on the same side, if this fermion is at higher energy, which is possible at higher temperature. So the work extracted can be non-zero because you can have both fermions on the same side of the barrier. Okay, it looks like there are a few more questions, but just for the sake of getting through some more of the material, I should probably go on ahead. And if we have time at the end, I'll come back to the rest of the questions. Thanks for asking. Very briefly, let's embark on a whirlwind tour of quantum thermodynamics. I like to envision quantum thermodynamics as a map. Map contains a bunch of city states and kingdoms and principalities and villages and towns, all representing different subfields of quantum thermodynamics. The different communities have different perspectives on, on quantum thermodynamics and use different toolkits. So there is no grand unified theory of quantum thermodynamics, but we can take a little tour of this map will be a whirlwind tour, like the tours of London and Paris and Rome and Venice in one week, which are not satisfying, but we can at least convey a taste of each subfield. One consists of quantum thermal machines. You can imagine what would happen if a quantum engine powered your car or cooled down other systems as a refrigerator or stored energy as batteries. These quantum thermal machines can achieve some powers or efficiencies or other metrics that classical machines can't achieve. As time is conjugate to energy, as I mentioned, it makes some sense that thermodynamics involves timekeeping. So suppose you want to build a quantum drone that delivers packages for quantum Amazon. That drone needs to be some autonomous quantum machine that can operate independently. So it needs some internal mechanism that tells it what to do when. It needs an internal or an autonomous clock. And since the whole machine is quantum, also the clock must be quantum. There's another field that involves fluctuation relations, which are certain special equalities derived within the subfield of stochastic quantum thermodynamics. So consider a system that's small and far from equilibrium, like a strand of DNA that's stretched between optical tweezers or a single trapped ion that's being dragged with some potential. Now, the quantities that characterize the process of stretching the DNA strand or dragging the ion, quantities like work and heat, will fluctuate from trial to trial if our little system is exchanging energy with a heat bath that will cause random fluctuations in the energy. So what can we say about the statistic the statistics of these quantities, the work and the heat. We can derive equalities that strengthen the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law is an inequality. It says that for every closed isolated system, the amount of entropy grows monotonically. The second law is an equality only for quasi-static processes, infinitely slow processes, which aren't the most realistic because they would take infinitely long. In contrast, fluctuations are equalities, so they're stronger statements, even when the system is far from equilibrium. So even if we stretch a DNA strand very quickly, the fluctuation relations can also provide a more detailed information about small, small systems and single trials than the second law can. Also focused on small scales is one shot statistical mechanics. In conventional thermodynamics, we think about the thermodynamic limit, which involves infinitely many particles, which self-average. 
I don't know about you, but I've never seen infinitely many particles. And sometimes averages matter less to us than single shots that are really important. So in one shot statistical mechanics, we reason about what we're guaranteed to achieve with some probability in a single shot of a thermodynamic task, such as work extraction or expenditure. In conventional thermodynamics, baths, heat baths are infinitely large. They have very short memories and they couple to the system of interest only weakly. So real world baths have finite sizes. They do retain information and they can couple strongly. So how do these properties change our expectations? For instance, about the thermalization of the small system of interest. Suppose that you want to run a quantum computer, then you need a bunch of ancilla qubits prepared in some fiducial state, like the zero state. We can regard these zero qubits as being sort of like baths at zero temperature. We can cool these qubits to this valuable zero state by manipulating the correlations between the qubits or by running an algorithm, an algorithmic cooling. Resource theories on the subfields I've worked on a lot. These are simple information theoretic models for thermodynamic settings. Um, some of the results here are different sorts of strengthenings of the second law of thermodynamics alternative to fluctuation relations. Um, there are more that I won't get to talk about in the interest of time, but I'll mention, mention just one more because it's very near and dear to my heart. So applications of quantum thermodynamics across science. Quantum thermodynamicists now have a decent toolkit of quantum information theoretic thermodynamics. We can use that toolkit as a new lens through which to view various subfields in which people also care about energy, information, and quantum physics. So chemistry, condensed matter, atomic, molecular, and optical physics, high energy and black hole physics, and biophysics. So there is a lot of material to explore here in quantum thermodynamics, and I very much encourage anyone interested to try out the field. Thanks for your time.